Well, good morning, everybody. Welcome to the Midwest Dream Car Collection for our monthly tread talk. It's always good to see so many familiar faces and some new faces this morning. We are so pleased to have Dan Menick as our speaker this morning. Uh, Dan is a familiar face around the museum. He has served as a docent on the display floor since the very beginning, since we opened our doors, and has served on our museum's collections advisory board for the last couple of years. His wife, Sherry, many of you know, is on our museum staff here. She serves as the director of events and programs. I did find it convenient that she took a trip to Colorado on the, the weekend you're supposed to do your talk, so <laughs> I'll have to report she back. She doesn't want to listen. <laughs> anyway, Dan is an instructor at K-State in the Department of Business Administration, which when you listen to his presentations, you can tell he's a teacher. They're very well organized and, and presented well, but he's promised me there will not be a pop quiz or an essay exam at the end of the, end of the presentation. But I was promised enjoyed. that. Huh? I didn't promise that. Well, yeah, you did. <laughs> And uh, anyway, Dan's a great speaker, and he's given several of these, and I know you'll enjoy it. Uh, today, Dan's going to speak on automotive legend and executive Lee Iacocca. Maybe you know Lee Iacocca from the development of the Ford Mustang, as well as helping to save Chrysler Corporation in the 1980s. But Dan's going to tell you about those things and much, much more, so let's turn it over to Dan. Thank you, Dan. Thank you, Doug, and thanks, everyone. So. Lee Iacocca, um, interesting topic. When I did this, I thought, well, this will be short and easy to throw together. The more you dig, the more there is, and then you start realizing, okay, we need to boil this down. Um, this still may be a little lengthy. Um, I don't think it'll be too bad, though. So probably um, a lot of you have heard of him, and some people have good opinions, some people have maybe not so good opinions. I guess it depends on your perspective. There's a lot of information out there. He's actually done quite a bit in the automotive world. Um, maybe a lot more than you even realize. So with that, I'm gonna kind of give a, a history and a kind of, I guess, a short biography of the man and what he was responsible for throughout his whole life and career. So, we're going to back up a little bit, and this is his father, Nicola Iacocca. Uh, in 1902, he arrived in the U.S. as an immigrant, and poor, alone, and scared, came from San Marco, Italy, which is just north of Naples on the west coast of Italian Peninsula. When he came to the U.S., first thing he saw, Statue of Liberty, which was symbol of hope for millions of immigrants who passed through Statue of Liberty and Ellis Island. Um, that will be important later on as we go through this talk. So Nicola Iacocca worked odd jobs. He actually joined the Army in World War I. He um, trained ambulance drivers, and then he moved to Allentown, Pennsylvania, and he worked odd jobs. And by 1921, he had saved up enough money to go back and bring his widowed mother to the uh, United States. But while he was back in Italy, he met a 17-year-old daughter of a shoemaker. He was 31, she was 17. They got married within a few weeks. And he brought her back as well to the US. Um, and there's a whole side story to that too. She had actually had, I believe, typhoid fever um, on the voyage over, and normally immigration would have said no, but his Nicola was able to kind of bamboozle his way and get her in the U.S. They opened a hot dog restaurant in Allentown called the Orpheum Wiener House. He brought his brothers into the business, and his brothers took it over and still operate it today. Uh, Yoko's, the hot dog king, Yoko was how Pennsylvania Dutch people pronounced Iacocca. They couldn't pronounce it. It was too strange and foreign of a name. And so Yoko is what they called it, and the name stuck. Um, Yoko's.com, you can go look it up, and they've got, I don't know how many stores out there, and descendants of those brothers of Nicola still run that. So um, Nicola and his wife had two kids, Delma in 1922, and then in 1924, Lido Anthony, whose nickname became Lee, as we'll find out here. Born in Allentown, 1924. So Lee, his parents, um, after the hot dog 
restaurant. His parents went into a movie theater business and then real estate and um, developing in a home development and actually were somewhat successful. Not wealthy by any means, but made a modest living. When Lee was 10 years old, he worked freelance delivery person at the gro local grocery store, worked long hours, worked in a fruit market when he was 16 years old. I mean, he was kind of an industrious um, teenager at that point. Went to school in Allentown, and in his biography, he talks a lot about growing up racial prejudiced. Um, was called a lot of Italian slurs, uh, made fun of for being Italian. Um, at age 15, he catches rheumatic fever, and he was in bed for six months, lost 40 pounds. And 40 pounds to a teenage kid is a lot of weight. Um, read a lot of books, and I think that probably solidified a lot of his personality about learning and book learning as well. He finished high school, graduated 12th out of 900, was really pretty a smart kid. and. Um, he actually was class president his senior year. And this is uh, from the yearbook in Allentown there. Um, and it got a couple of things here I want to read. It says, when you aim at anything, you are sure to hit it. And Lee, Lee is a raconteur extraordinary. Not only can he quip with the best, but he can pun with the worst. If knowledge really is power, he is omnipotent. This, together with the ability he has developed in engineering and directing school affairs, will prove a great asset in his career of engineering, which was very um, prediction, predict, predictory of, of his future. After high school, went to Lehigh University there in eastern Pennsylvania. He actually got a 4F deferment in the draft um, in 1942, which he was kind of um, dejected about. He felt he was a second class citizen because he couldn't, couldn't enlist. Um, so he buried himself in books. He graduated Lee, uh, Lehigh University with a 3.53 in industrial engineering, was a member of Theta Chi uh, fraternity. And he drove, this is not his actual car, but a pretty close depiction of what it was. He drove a 60 uh, horsepower 38 Ford and he always had the comment, he said, these guys need me. Anybody who builds a car this bad can use some help. And he just had in his head, he goes, I need to go work for Ford. This is really a bad, bad product. Ford, Ford came recruiting to Lehigh University and a Ford recruiter driving a Lincoln Continental, the first generation, really impressed Lee. He uh, saw that Continental and was just wowed by it. He was like, wow, this is amazing. Um, Ford's policy at that time, they visited 50 universities and they recruited a student from every university, which is kind of an odd policy. But um, they picked Lee from Lehigh University. And at the same time, one of the uh, placement directors at Lehigh said, hey, there's this opportunity to go to Princeton and you can actually apply and get a fellowship grant that covers all expenses for a master's degree. He applies and he actually won the uh, scholarship and fellowship at Princeton. So now he's got a decision. Does he go for Ford? Does he go to Princeton and get his master's? He talks to Ford. Ford um, actually says, go to Princeton, finish your master's. We'll save a spot for you when you get done. So he did that. He um, went to Princeton, said it was an amazing learning experience. There were two professors on campus, one named Einstein and another named Oppenheimer. Um, he said he would pass, in, pass um, walking to class, he would pass Einstein every morning. And he would just say, hello professor, and here's this you know, guy with crazy hair um, just walking around on campus. Um, so that's kind of, you know, we think of those two guys as kind of you know, up on a pedestal, but they were just normal college professor kind of guys walking around Princeton at the time while he was uh, going to school there. Finishes his master's at Princeton, and he actually starts at Ford in August of 46. This is his first paycheck, uh, $37.40. Um, I don't know if that's for a week, a month, or what, but doesn't seem like much. 
Nine months in to his job at um, Ford, he realizes, I don't want to be doing this engineering stuff my whole life. This is kind of dull. Um, and he requests a move over to sales and marketing. And they finally approve it. And he goes over to sales. And they transfer him back to Pennsylvania. And he actually is um, fleet sales in Chester, which is outside of Philadelphia. And then he became a zone manager at Wilkes Bar in 1949. And he met Mary McCleary. She was a receptionist at the Ford plant in Chester, and they got married by 1956. 1956, Ford had a campaign to promote safety. They had um, padded dashboard, uh, dish steering wheel, safety door latches, seat belts, um, which were optional. Uh, it wasn't a successful sales program. Nobody wanted safety in the mid-50s. But Lee, as um, zone manager, um, he does a demonstration to dealers showing how safe the padding is. So he had the padding of the dash on the floor, and he drops an egg from the top of the ladder and says, see how safe this is? This egg's not going to break. Well, it did. And he tries it four times, and every egg breaks after that. Um, by the fifth one, actually, it doesn't break. He gets a standing ovation from the dealers at that point. but. Um, he says, I'm never going to do this again. So um, he does come up with a program uh, in 1956 that um, sales were flat. And his zone was actually the worst in the nation. And so you got to do something. If you're a sales zone manager and you're in the last place, you better come up with something. So he came up with this plan and his campaign of 20% down. $56 a month to buy a 56 Ford. Financing was kind of not a thing back in the 50s, and this was kind of a new concept, um, kind of just taking off. And so he did this uh, in his zone there in uh, eastern Pennsylvania. Sales from last, uh, in, the, in the Philadelphia zone go from last place to first place, which makes an impact at, at corporate headquarters in Ford, so much so that Ford Vice President McNamara, which is a name you might be familiar with, uh, McNamara sees that and says, hey, we're going to make this part of our national ad campaign, which they do. And that kind of became Lee's um, really big jump in, a, in his career that, hey, this guy's going somewhere. By 1959, the compact era um, is on. Um, imports had made a big impact. In, uh, in the US, and the big three were launching compacts. Uh, Ford launches the Falcon. And this was really the baby of Robert McNamara, who was VP of Ford and general manager of Ford Division. Robert McNamara said, transportation should be without gimmicks. He was kind of a no-nonsense, basic, back-to-earth, this is what transportation needs to be, not all this frills and stuff. Um, and we could do a whole talk, side talk on McNamara's influence at Ford. Um, McNamara was really the ultimate one who pulled the plug on Edsel. McNamara wanted to pull the plug on Lincoln. Um, Lincoln survived, much to McNamara's chagrin. But anyway, the Falcon was cheap to manufacture, conservative styling, and the Falcon actually outsold GM's Corvair and Chrysler's Valiant combined. They had 417,000 sales in the first year of Falcon. Now, um, because of that, McNamara's success elevated McNamara to president of Ford Motor Company. And here's McNamara with Henry Ford II. And as McNamara moves up, Iacocca gets tapped to be vice president and manager of Ford Division. And, um, but, this is November 1960. Something else happened November 1960, election. And newly President-elect Kennedy is looking for cabinet members. And he looks around and says, I like this President of Ford. And he taps McNamara. He actually offers him um, Secretary of the Treasury or Secretary of Defense. McNamara chooses Secretary of Defense. And that's a whole other side story, Vietnam War with McNamara as Secretary of Defense. I think to this day, actually, McNamara is the longest serving Secretary of Defense um, for the US, I believe. But 
Anyway, this is about Iacocca, not McNamara. So, Iacocca, as VP of Ford, um, installs a program of quarterly review, which this seems, you know, a, as a business person, this seems phenomenal that this wasn't a thing. Um, there was no kind of checks and balances. There was no kind of game plan at Ford. And Iacocca says, you know, we're doing this for stockholders. Why don't we do this internally? We need a quarterly plan and a quarterly review. And he instills that for all of his managers. Another thing that um, Iacocca was somewhat responsible for, on the books at Ford was a plan to produce the Ford Cardinal uh, V4. Uh, front wheel drive and it was going to be manufactured in the USA and Germany. Iacocca looks at it and says this is another McNamara cheap budget car. That market's kind of dying. He said what's happening is the youth market and that's what people want is this youth market and performance and he makes a recommendation to Henry Ford II that we're going to cut this car. This is not going to fly. Not in the US and they actually scrapped the plant. They were, um, had uh, begun converting the Louisville plant, um, which was an Edsel plant. They were getting ready to convert that to produce the Cardinal, and this gets the plug pulled, at least in the US, and it still goes forward in Germany. But um, Iacocca's vision is youth market and performance. And so along with that, What's happening over GM is, even though the Falcon beat Corvair and Valiant combined in sales, uh, Corvair's sales were mainly import conquest sales. In other words, Chevrolet sold Corvairs to people that might normally buy an import. Falcon sales generally cannibalized Ford full-size sales. In other words, the net gain for Ford wasn't an increase overall in sales, it was just a shift to people that might have bought a full-size Ford and now bought a Falcon. And so Chevrolet takes this Corvair also, gave it bucket seats, some sporty equipment, called the version the Monza, and really started tapping into that youth market. Hal Sperlich, who was Lee's aide, assistant, he looks at that and I didn't pull the full quote, um, it had some uh, words we shouldn't say. Um, he said, they have turned defeat into victory. They've captured this youth market that we've been talking about. We need to figure out how do we do that. And so uh, this committee's set up called the Fairlane Committee. And they look at how do we capture the youth market? That's really their mission. And so they take the V4 that was going to be used in that Ford Cardinal, and they install it mid-engine and create this little prototype and call it, it's called a Mustang, Mustang 1, which is what it was um, named. And this is a show car prototype to kind of gauge the waters to see, okay, what, what interest is there out, you know, out there in um, a small little sports car like this. Something else uh, Lee does is convinces Henry Ford II to reinst reinstigate Ford's racing program. Um, by the late 50s, uh, a lot of the manufacturers had kind of gotten away from racing, and Lee says, we need to get back in it. And this is a picture here of Benson Ford, uh, race driver Jim Clark, and Iacocca with the uh, Ford overhead cam race engine, which actually would win in Indy in 1965. He, Lee also uh, had a plan to sell engines to niche markets in performance vehicles. And he teams up with um, this guy named Carol Shelby. And Shelby, as you, as you know the story there, put a Ford V8 in the AC Ace and came up with the Shelby Cobra. And Lee was really instrumental in kind of getting Shelby American going, not as a Ford entity, but as a you know, customer of Ford buying Ford engines. They also sold engines to Roots Group, uh, installed in the Sunbeam Tiger, which we have one out on the floor here. This is a picture of Carol Shelby, Iacocca, 
and a managing director of Roots Group um, at the launch of the uh, Sunbeam Tiger. One side note here, um, if you've seen Ford versus Ferrari, um, Iacocca plays a role in the movie. That's probably a little bit exaggerated. Um, what, what I've read and studied about is Lee was not as involved in the dealings with Ferrari or Le Mans. Um, Lee was, you know, um, dealing with, Iac with a Shelby on um, selling engines, but not as involved in the uh, GT40 project. The Fairlane Committee finally gets specific about what we're going to produce to capture the youth market. And they come up with some um, basic specs, 2,500 pounds. They finally decide it needs to be a four-seater. Originally, they had talked about a two-seater. They felt, okay, the market's too small. They have kind of learned that from the Thunderbird project when they grew it to a four-seater in 58. Um, but people had said, customers had said, we like that old two-seater Thunderbird. Don't you have anything small? So um, styling. Iacocca remembers that long hood, short deck version of the original Continental that the recruiter called on him and feels that's a good look. Typical budget, 300 to 400 million dollars to produce a new car. That isn't in the budget. How do we make this happen? Well, if we can use as much of the Falcon as possible, we can make this fly. And he assigns um, Hal Sperlick, which um, Hal was Lee's assistant, and uh, Don Fry are assigned to the project here. And so they come up with a prototype called the Cougar. Used as much of the Falcon as possible, used um, dashboard, firewall, axles, mechanicals, and the budget actually comes in at only 75 million, which for a new car project for manufacturer, that's actually a pretty, pretty decent price. So you can see starting to take shape here, the look of what will become the Mustang. It's named Cougar still at this point. Um, several prototypes. You've got the Cougar badge in the middle of the grill. Um, this is from 1962. Um, still have the Cougar emblem. You notice the background, a Corvair Monza, which was their real target, um, what they were trying to tackle against. And here's another prototype. This is by 1963. Side panels are kind of taking shape. Henry Ford II suggests Thunderbird II is the name. The committee product strategy boils it down to four names, Monaco, Cougar, Monte Carlo, and Torino. Then they finally boil it down to two, Torino or Cougar, and they finally select Torino. But they said, we're going to still use that Cougar logo. We're going to call it Torino. Until PR calls and says, don't use Torino that has Italian connotations. And why can't you use it? Well, Henry Ford II is seeing on the side this Italian gal, and we don't want that to be kind of public information. So, this is Christina Vittori Austin, who will later become Henry Ford II's second wife. So, okay, we can't use an Italian name. Scratch that, although they did use Torino later. I think that was after she became his wife that it was okay. But um, so they go back to Mustang, um, which was that original prototype, and finally agree on the name Mustang. Launched on April 17th, 1964, Mustang and Iacocca are featured on both the covers of Time and Newsweek. It's a big deal. Nothing is mentioned of Henry Ford II. Keep in mind, that's who runs the company and whose name is on the building. But Iacocca's plastered on the front of the magazines. First year sales. Iacocca has this goal of, we need to beat the Falcon's record of 417,000 sales because that was McNamara's car and that was just what Iacocca called a granny car. That's terrible, we need to beat that. And so, if you'll notice on the license plate here, the goal was 417 by 417. So within a year of the launch, by the next April, we need to have beaten that. And they did. 418,812 were sold by uh, April 16, 1965. That's a photo of Iacocca and Don Fry. 
the other guy who was in uh, charge of the program, Hal Sperlick and Don Fry were in, really in charge of the program. Iacocca oversaw it. For an encore to the Mustang, Iacocca has this vision. He's at a dealer meeting in Canada and he says lying in his hotel room one night, he just says, we need to put a Rolls Royce grill on a Thunderbird. And so he calls up product development and says, hey, let's do this. So they take a Thunderbird platform, throw a Rolls Royce grill on it and the Continental Mark III was born. Next, next on the list, imports are still gaining sales in the U.S. And Iacocca oversees, let's take the Falcon platform again, massage it, and create the Maverick and make something new out of it. And, he's, and that was really kind of a, a um, car that Iacocca oversaw as well. 1968, Bunky Knudsen, who was a senior executive at GM, he was at Pontiac in the 50s, he was responsible for turning Pontiac into a performance division, the white track Pontiac, he was responsible for hiring a guy named John DeLorean away from Packard. Uh, Newton was also responsible for creating the Chevrolet SS series and pretty influential at GM. He gets passed over for the presidency at GM and GM selects Ed Cole instead of Newton. Henry Ford II sees that as, here's an opportunity. I can grab somebody from GM and we can get some of that GM magic that we're always trying to compete against. And so he offers Knudsen the presidency of Ford Motor Corporation. Brings Knudsen in above Iacocca. Iacocca's in charge of Ford Division. And so here's uh, Bunky Knudsen and Iacocca. So Iacocca doesn't really like that. There's a lot of people at Ford that don't like this. See somebody coming in from the competition and now they're your boss. Battle lines are drawn. Knudsen and Iacocca do not see eye to eye on anything. Knudsen has this vision. He says, we need a new small car for Ford. Ford of Europe can develop it. They have the expertise. They do small cars. We can have them do it and we can probably bring it in at around 2,400 bucks. Iacocca, not wanting to submit to Newton, says, I can do a car for under $2,000 and under 2,000 pounds, and we can do it here in the US. The gauntlet's been dropped. That car, the Pinto. Engineers working saying, we don't like working under those constraints. You just can't magically throw out numbers like that, 2,000 pounds and under $2,000. We're gonna have to compromise stuff. That's the story of the Pinto, which is probably another story for another day. But um, some of you know there were safety issues with the Pinto as a result of that. Knudsen also brings over from GM this designer called Larry Shinoda. Larry Shinoda designs on the left this red car here, a prototype called the Mach 2 which was kind of going to be a Ford Halo vehicle. Let's kind of play around with hey, we need a nice two-seater performance vehicle. Iacocca, again, not wanting to submit to news and says, I can do something better than you. I've got my buddy over in Italy, Alessandro de Tommaso, who has just bought the Ghia company. I'll have him create a supercar, the Pantera, which is on the right. Knudsen, um, also has designers, and some of you have probably read this. Um, the 74 Thunderbird looks like a Pontiac. Um, that's Newton's responsibility. 71 full-size Fords look like a Pontiac front end. That's Newton's responsibility. And um, lots of design decisions done by Newton, um, much to uh, other management not liking those decisions. Um, Newton also kind of digs and founds that um, Fugazi, a, a limo service in New York City, who's a friend of Iacocca's family, they had actually overcharged Ford by $300,000. That doesn't sit well with Iacocca. Um, a lot of friction in upper management. 
and executives at this point are kind of like, eh, we got to draw sides here, I don't like this. And so finally, after 19 months, Henry Ford II, here with uh, Bunky Knudsen, uh, relieves Knudsen and says, it's just not working out. And so Knudsen's now gone. Iacocca says, you know this Pantera I cooked up, we need to buy 30% of that company, the company Ghia that um, De Tommaso runs. And so they do. However, the Pantera project is plagued with issues. It kind of stumbles along, never gets good sales. And once it kind of is stumbling, Iacocca assigns it to Bill Ford and says, okay, Bill, you run this. Um, Bill, as you know, as a side story, um, one of Henry's younger brothers, uh, Bill was really responsible for the Continental Mark II in the 50s, and he always kind of felt down because his car got canceled and he was never um, felt like he had a, a part in the company, but his name is still Ford. Lee assigns this to Bill and says, here, you can have this, even though it was kind of failing at that point. Now. Was that um, Lee diverting, saying, okay, it's not my failure, it's Bill's, or was that saying, Bill's the only one that can salvage this because his name's Ford? I don't know. Um, that's a little murky to go, what's the real motives here? But So after newtson has gone, Henry Ford II sets up what he calls a troika, a three-way presidency. You know, Iacocca is probably feeling like, okay, Newtson's gone, I'm going to be promoted. No, Henry Ford does this lateral side move saying, I'm going to split the presidency into three parts. North America, Lee, you can have that. International, Phil Caldwell's going to have that. And then there's non-automotive. That lasts for about a year. And Henry Ford II finally feels like, okay, this really isn't working. And he does name Iacocca president in full of the Ford Motor Company in December of 1970. Now, little aside, over on the truck side, Hal Spearlake, who was responsible for the Mustang along with Lee and Don Fry, um, Hal Spearlake is promoted to VP of Truck Division, and he's still kind of really close with Iacocca. Over at the Truck Division, they're working with Mazda on bringing the Ford Courier over as Mazda. They're looking at what vans Mazda's making. They're going, you know, there's these little vans that would be really kind of cool. Why don't we kind of kick that idea around? So Hal Sperlick works on a couple things. The top one is what's called the Minimax. That was actually built um, by Ghia, the Tommaso's company who did the Pantera. These are just prototypes. The bottom one is the Ford Carousel. Um, neither of them get produced. Um, upper management finally feels like that's just going to cannibalize sales from wagons and put that project on the back burner. The, the bottom one actually does influence the later uh, Econoline vans. You can see some uh, similarities to some of the design in the mid-70s Econolines, but how Sperlick's baby, keep that in the back of your mind. Hal, sen, uh, Hal Sperlick goes to Ford of Europe. Iacocca sends him to Europe after a year and a half uh, being VP of truck. Um, Sperlick really wants to stay in Europe, or in the trucks, but Lee uh, wants him in Europe. Uh, Hal Sperlick leads the team that creates the Ford Fiesta, which is a huge success in Europe. Um, it's um, actually just recently um, ended production after, I believe, like eight generations of the Ford Fiesta over in Europe. Another thing Lee does, mid-70s, the Brougham era is underway, and basically taking Falcon underpinnings and massaging it some more, Lee creates the Ford Granada and Mercury Monarch, which were pretty good sales successes those first few years it was out. Lee and Hal Sperlick have this idea, and it's called Project Wolf. Taking that Fiesta that Hal had designed for Europe, they say, we need to enlarge it a little bit and bring it to the U.S. They kick things around, um, budget isn't there to develop a new motor for it. Lee actually goes to Japan and does a deal with Honda, saying, we can buy engines, transmissions from Honda, and um, we can make this project fly. 
Henry Ford II says, um, quote, no name, no car with my name on the hood is going to have a Jap engine inside. Project scrapped. And so Iacob and Spirlik really had this vision of this could be a sporty little small car if we would just enlarge this vehicle. Um, it, gets, it gets the axe. Um, Phil Caldwell is actually in charge of Ford International. Um, he says no. And Henry Ford II sides with him. By this time, you'll notice Henry Ford II has kind of vetoed some things Iacocca has done. Um, Spirlik was a divisive person, what I've read about Hal Spirlik. You know, he helped design the Mustang and he created the Fiesta. And, um, influential on lots of things, but he's kind of Lee's buddy, right-hand man. Um, what I've read is that at board meetings, Hal was constantly sitting next to Lee and they were always kind of making comments about Henry Ford II and kind of talking about him behind his back. Um, Henry has a heart attack about this time and his second marriage to the Italian gal is falling apart and after his heart attack he finally realizes, you know, what's life going to be like for, the, for my company after I'm gone? Um, Ford family still owns significant shares in Ford Motor Company, enough to control um, voting rights. And Henry Ford II is kind of tired of Hal Sperlick, kind of constantly whispering in Lee's ear things. And he says, fire that guy, get rid of him. Lee says, you've got to be kidding, he's the best we got, he's responsible for the Mustang and the Fiesta. Henry Ford II, fire him now, if you don't can him right now, you'll go out the door with him. Don't give me any BS, I don't like him, you're not entitled to ask why. And so, Spirlick gets fired, Lee has somebody else do it actually. Um, within, um, I think within a month of that, President Chrysler has lunch with Hal Spirlick, and Hal Spirlick is at Chrysler by 1977. Phil Caldwell, who's head of Ford International under Lee. Lee is president of the company. Here is Iacocca, Henry Ford II, and Phil Caldwell. During Caldwell's term at Ford International, overseas profits were up 380%. Pretty impressive. However, North America had kind of remained stagnant which was really the um, responsibility of Iacocca. So Henry Ford II, after having McKinsey, um, McKinsey Consulting coming in and um, doing some consulting on uh, structuring of corporate organization, he creates another three-person troika. And he essentially bumps Phil Caldwell up around past Iacocca. So Caldwell was reporting to Iacocca. Now Caldwell is vice chairman, and actually Iacocca is now reporting to Caldwell. Yeah, awkward. At the same time, there is um, a bunch of shareholders that are filing suit against Ford for misuse of funds, um, there was a deal going on in Indonesia. They felt there was kickbacks and bribes, and a lot of the shareholders were saying, we need to get to the bottom of this. They get attorney Roy Cohn, um, famous or infamous um, attorney. Um, there's lots of ties from Roy Cohn to various things. Um, McCarthy in the um, 1950s communist purge and then also to a former president recently um, has pretty strong ties to Roy Cohn. But that's neither here nor there. Um, Cohn also brings up the safety issue with the Pinto, which was Iacocca's baby as well. De Tommaso, who is tied to Iacocca, sides with Cohn and the um, investor lawsuits, and by this time, things have kind of deteriorated between Henry Ford II and Iacocca. And Henry Ford II finally says, you know, things have just kind of reached ahead and Iacocca needs to go. And so in July 1978, Henry Ford II and his brother Bill meet with Iacocca, 
and said, it's been a nice association, but I think you should leave. It's best for the company, and then the infamous line you may have heard before, well, sometimes you just don't like someone. I coke is out at Ford. Now, meanwhile, John Ricardo over at Chrysler is looking for new leadership. Iacocca's fair game now. And so John Ricardo calls on Lee by that fall. Lee will be president of Chrysler, and then the following year, the plan is he will assume chairmanship. November 2nd, 1978, the Detroit Free Press publishes this paper with two headlines. Chrysler losses are the worst ever, and Lee Iacocca joins Chrysler. Chrysler at this point is really struggling. Iacocca and John Ricardo ask Congress for loans. Ricardo does agree to step down by fall of 79. Congress does authorize 1.5 billion in loan guarantees, but Chrysler must do private matching um, to match that, and there were some concessions that had to be made from both union and salaried workers. And then in January 1980, President Carter signed the bill of that. Iacocca puts together a team at Chrysler. Um, here is all X4 people. Iacocca, next to him is Jerry Greenwald, who became vice chairman at Chrysler. He was at Ford of Venezuela. Um, Hal Sperlick, um, the Mustang guy. Uh, next to him and Bennett Bidwell, who I believe was in sales at Ford. And those are all people he trusted, put them in, in um, key leadership positions. And the K cars, the infamous uh, car that everybody associates with Iacocca, they'd actually been on the um, drawing board at Chrysler before Iacocca came. Hal Sperlick was actually involved in some of that. And so they had to share those plans to Congress. That helped pass the loan package. Iacocca oversees the launch of those cars. And those of you old enough to remember. For too long now, America has been taking a beating at the gas pump. And for too long, America has been depending on imports for high mileage cars. Well, Yankee ingenuity is still alive and well. The new Chrysler Corporation introduces the K cars. The American way to beat the pump. K cars. Aries K from Dodge, Reliant K from Plymouth. Six all new fuel efficient front wheel drive, quality built cars and wagons. Only K cars come with the simple, easy to service direct drive power system that makes K cars the only front wheel drive cars with high mileage and room for six Americans. If everybody in the U.S. drove a K car, we wouldn't have to import a single drop of OPEC oil for gasoline. Chrysler's K-Cars are here right now to challenge the imports. K-Cars, the American way to beat the pump. Nineteen eighty-three, uh, just a couple years after that, uh, Lee's wife Mary passes away due to complications from diabetes. Um, they had had two daughters, Kathy and Leah, and um, she passes away, like I said, from, from uh, complications from diabetes. Just after that, Chrysler pays off its loans early, seven years ahead of schedule, um, saving millions in interest. And um, that was a kind of a big deal, that Chrysler did become successful as a result of that, and a um, result of a lot of what Iacocca did at Chrysler. And this, the infamous line, if you can find a better car, buy it. If a manufacturer doesn't have enough confidence in the quality of what he makes, he doesn't have the right to ask you to buy it. And it doesn't make any difference what he makes, washing machines, toasters, or roller skates. Me, I'm in the car business. And I've been saying for a long time that Chrysler makes cars that are as good, if not better, than anything coming out of America, Europe, or Japan. Now, to show you the kind of confidence we have in the quality of our products, right now, when you buy any new Chrysler, Plymouth, or Dodge American-built passenger car, Chrysler will protect your investment three ways. One, a five-year or 50,000-mile protection plan on the engine and powertrain. Two, five years or 50,000 miles rust-through protection on the outside of the car. Three, 
five-year or 50,000-mile free scheduled maintenance. Now, that's confidence. But let's face it, if we don't believe in our products, why should you? So, if you can find better protection, take it. If you can find a better car, buy it. The minivan. Hal Sperlick. Remember, he had worked on those projects back at Ford. He's in charge of product planning at Chrysler. He says, hey, here's this idea we had. We can base this off of the K car, and we can make this thing fly. And it actually does. Um, millions are sold. Chrysler ends up being the leader in minivans that really, to this day, still kind of dominate the market minivans in, in the US and the North America. 1982, which is backing up a year or two here, but President Reagan asked Lee to head a private sector effort to raise funds for renovation of Ellis Island and the Statue of Liberty. I mean, he's a first generation immigrant. Um, his parents immigrated um, to the US, as we saw earlier. He actually raises $156 million towards that effort. Um, they do the renovation to Statue of Liberty and Ellis Island, and here is him with his mother, who had um, first set foot in America, you know, 40 years, some 40 years earlier um, to, the, to the day when uh, she, she came to the U.S. from Italy. Lee teams up with his old buddy, Carol Shelby, and actually um, works some magic on the uh, Chrysler's Omni, Charger, Lancer. This is actually the first time Shelby has returned to production cars since uh, the Mustang-based Shelby in the late 60s. After popularity um, with commercials and what he did at Chrysler, there's a movement of Iacocca running for president in 88. And Iacocca actually does consider it, but he talks to his buddy Tip O'Neill, who was speaker at the house at the time, and Tip says, are you insane? You don't want this. They said, he said, what, what you're used to is making a decision and getting things done. He said, that isn't going to happen if you're president. He said, it's, you would be frustrated beyond belief. And so Lee bows out and does not, um, there's actually a speech where he says, I will not accept any nomination, kind of like LBJ did um, 15 years earlier. K-car mutations. Lee continues to invest in taking that K-car platform design and modifying it, making sports cars, convertibles, minivans, limousines, um, all kinds of things. Even up into, by the early 90s, it's still massaged and, and um, modified K-car platform. Lee also uh, teams up with his buddy Tommaso from back who did the Pantera and they produced the uh, TC by Chrysler TC by Maserati. Um, most other executives say this is a bad idea, um, but Lee forges ahead. Only about 7,300 of those are built. Um, two-seater, kind of sports convertible, kind of almost echoing back to a two-seater Thunderbird in a way, uh, but K-car based. Chrysler is making record profits by this time, by the late 1980s. Um, they buy Gulfstream Air in 1985, they actually sell it in 89. They buy American Motors Jeep in 1987, which really results in a huge culture organizational shift internally at Chrysler. 1987, they also bought Lamborghini, which they sell five years later. They um, had a prototype show car called the Lamborghini Portofino, which actually really was the influencer in the uh, LH cars, the uh, Dodge Intrepid, Chrysler Concorde. And uh, the Lamborghini Diablo has a lot of Chrysler influence in it as well. Iacocca oversees the new tech center at Chrysler, which would ultimately become corporate headquarters with the tower. Um, construction was completed between 91 to 96. It is actually still, I believe, one of the largest office corporate buildings in the world today. Iacocca green lights um, a Dodge supercar, the Viper, which was really kind of Bob Lutz, Tom Gale's baby, but um, Iacocca green lights it. Now, Iacocca um, 
fails to name a successor, and that kind of drags on and on. He keeps saying he's going to retire, and he doesn't. Um, Bob Lutz thinks the job is his, kind of like echoes of 20 years ago when um, Iacocca gets passed over uh, by Knudsen. Um, Iacocca feels Lutz is kind of divisive, and he actually picks Bob Eaton, who was head of General Motors Europe, and by the way, Bob Eaton is a KU graduate from Ark City, Kansas. So it's kind of interesting that Chrysler, Walter Chrysler himself was um, a Kansas native. And Bob Eaton, I believe, was actually born maybe Colorado Springs, but he moved to, they moved to Ark City when he was a, a kid. Chrysler still making record profits by the early 90s. Uh, Kirk Kerkorian, a uh, multi-billionaire who owns MGM Grand, lots of casinos. He's actually Chrysler's largest shareholder. I believe he held like 10% of Chrysler stock. He plans to buy Chrysler for $23 billion. He makes an offer to shareholders. He's going to offer, I believe, 50 some dollars a share and had been trading somewhere in the 30s. He thinks, okay, this is a good deal. This is a win-win for everybody. Iacocca is actually acting as advisor to Kerkorian. The board views this as a hostile takeover. Kerkorian thinks, well, this is a friendly takeover. The board says, no, this is a hostile takeover because you don't have financing. And so that really sets in motion Chrysler's board saying, we need to be part of a bigger company to ward off stock raider traders and so that really leads to pursuing Daimler Chrysler which again is a whole other story. Because of Iacocca's involvement with Kokorian, Chrysler board actually blocks Iacocca from exercising his stock options saying your uh, consulting with Kokorian violated your terms of agreement when you left. 1995, Iacocca then turns around and says, I'm going to sue Chrysler for $42 million because you're blocking my share options. They actually settle out of court um, paying Iacocca $21 million. Moving into the 21st century, Iacocca um, still involved in the auto industry, electric scooter, scooter venture, olive oil, speaking and great engagements book writing, philanthropy, and education, diabetes. He does make peace with Chrysler after the lawsuit, and he actually ends up doing some commercials uh, for Chrysler. He, uh, there's he, there he is with Snoop Dogg, actually, which is kind of interesting. Um, teams up with Chrysler Foundation. They uh, create a partnership for diabetes research, and what he's done philanthropy-wise. Um, a lot of it's at Lehigh University, um, they start the Iacocca Institute there, which has uh, intercultural learning experiences. Um, they have four chairs at the university there. The uh, Iacocca Intern International Internship Program, which funds real world global work abroad for students. Um, they also make a $5 million gift to uh, the Iacocca Institute that um, endows it. However, he passes away um, at age 94 in 2019, complications of Parkinson's. He is survived by two daughters, eight grandchildren. Now, what did he accomplish in his life? Here's what he oversaw and what he's responsible for. Really, he sold Ford engines to Shelby. That's really kind of the result of him being involved. Responsible for the Mustang, the Continental Mark III, the Pantera, the Maverick, the Pinto, Ford Granada, Mercury Monarch, numerous Chrysler K permutations, the Shelby tie-up with Dodge, Chrysler minivans, the purchase of AMC Jeep, the Dodge Viper, author of three books, oversaw Chrysler Tech Center building, met with at least nine U.S. presidents. I mean, that's a pretty impressive uh, career span. And I want to leave you with this. Looks like the Chrysler Group has done it again. They have their most award-winning and freshest lineup ever. They have 12 vehicles with five-star frontal crash test ratings.
and their vehicles are projected to retain their value better than GM or Ford. You know what's missing? A great deal. It's Employee Pricing Plus, our employee discount plus cash allowance on Chrysler, Jeep, and Dodge. It's like you always used to say, Grandpa. If you can find a better car, buy it. That's my girl. That's actually his granddaughter, so. And with that, that's the story of Lee Iacocca. Any, any questions, quick? Yes. What was the name of his famous book that he wrote? Back so he wrote three books. Um, I believe the, the um, I have it here, Auto, Iacocca, an autobiography, 1984. He wrote that. He wrote another one, which I don't have in my bibliography, um, Straight Talk, which I think that was written in the 90s, maybe. And then the last one he wrote was um, Where Have All the Leaders Gone, which was my opening slide, the cover of that. Um, that one was written in 2007, 2008, right around the time of the financial crisis. So how's Chrysler doing today? So <laughs> that's a whole other topic, but Chrysler is now part of Stellantis, which is the company that was formed between the merger of Peugeot, PSA, and FCA, Fiat Chrysler. Um, they're doing okay. Um, Chrysler in the US, I think sales are down this past year. Um, they've got a lot of plans on the books though. Um, what they're going to come out with. Um, Stellantis is basically controlled by two key families, um, the Peugeot family in France and the Agnelli family in Italy um, through their family corporate holdings, but um, that's who's really kind of running the show um, out of Paris, interestingly enough. So, all right. <laughs>